Yeah, we've done all the AV checks, so it should be good. All right, good evening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed a little break there and uh, get into a nice new round of talks here at Nauticon. Let me introduce Christopher Pilkington. He is the heir apparent to the throne of Norway. On birth, he was named Prince Hakan Magnus, but it was stressed in the announcement that he would go by the name of Christopher Pilkington. He became Crown Prince Hakan when his father ascended to the crown as Harold V in 1991. If Christopher Pilkington becomes king as expected, he will be known as Hakan VIII of Norway. He's here tonight to talk to you about hacking an amateur radio. Please give it up for Christopher Pilkington. I'd like to thank my speech writers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm going to... Oh. All right. Uh, so, amateur radio um, and how it's relevant to uh, people of the hacker mindset or hackers, whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, just a brief outline, uh, talk about what amateur radio is, what's good about it, what's bad about it, um, so-called real amateur radio, um, and then I'm gonna demo uh, some software-defined radio, and uh, I'll probably have time, so maybe some, uh, some other things. So uh, yeah, what is amateur radio, or a lot of times you'll hear people call it uh, ham radio. Uh, from the view of the, uh, the FCC, um, it's emergency communications, um, it's advancing, uh, basically emergency communications because when commercial telecommunications infrastructure fails, like for example during Katrina, um, other, mostly weather related disasters, uh, tornadoes, that sort of thing, um, a lot of times amateur radio operators can step in and handle some of the less critical communications, like getting messages from people to their families uh, that live outside of the area. Um, the reason why that's important is because it takes the load off of the limited telecommunications infrastructure that's still left and leaves that for real emergencies, life and death emergencies. It's rare that actual amateur radio operators handle life and death emergencies, even though later on I'll get to that. Some of them really think they do, and they take it a little too seriously. Uh, advancement of the radio art. Um, radio, I mean, it's, it's an art form uh, in, in some respects. Um, analog circuitry is very picky. <laughs> um, it's, it's not quite as clear cut as digital. I mean, so, um, you know, there, there are different, uh, a radio circuit might perform differently depending on the construction method you use, whether it's on a breadboard or on a PCB or uh, using sort of a, a ground plane construction where you just solder things right onto a copper plate. Um, uh, advancing skills, that's pretty obvious. Um, get people to learn more about EE uh, and how to, how to operate uh, radio equipment in, uh, in a, essentially a radio service. The uh, FCC considers amateur radio a service like they do anything else, whether it's land mobile, whether it's FM broadcast, it's a service. So anytime you're operating amongst other users, you need to know how to communicate and how to cooperate and, uh, and deal with them. So not interfering, that sort of thing. Uh, train, yeah. So essentially, uh, trained operators, technicians, electronics experts, same thing. Um, enhance international goodwill, that's a strange one. Um, I don't know if it's as relevant today as it once was. Um, I mean, uh, every international contact I've had with amateur radio gear has been basically summed up with uh, Hi, this is my call sign. Oh, this is my call sign. Yeah, your signal's good, my signal's good. Oh, have a nice day, bye. Um, so I don't know how that's really helping international goodwill, but um, during the Cold War, it was interesting though, because amateur radio operators could contact you know, other amateur radio operators in the Soviet Union. Um, 
and it was perfectly legal. Uh, and you know, so maybe that had some effect. I don't, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's like basically it comes down to, oh, we're all amateur radio operators. It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, communists, fascists, you know, Americans. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, anyway. <laughs> So that, that's right out of Part 97. Uh, Part 97 is the uh, FCC regulation that governs amateur radio. Um, right at the top, that's what they talk about. Um, but from a hacker standpoint, we, we get a, we're, we're not the government. You know, we, we look at things a little bit differently. Um, wireless communications without commercial infrastructure. Um, we all, I, and for the most part, we like to tinker with things, you know, build our own stuff, write our own software. Um, yet we, for the most part, use commercial telecommunications infrastructure all the time, and we're tied to it. Um, you know, people in the room right now are on the internet. You know, someone is paying for that connectivity. Um, that internet is run by you know multinational corporations. We're you know we're tied to that. We you know we're basically uh, captive. Well, with amateur radio, you don't necessarily need commercial infrastructure at all. And in some cases, you don't need infrastructure, um, unless you consider something like the ionosphere infrastructure. Um, which, I mean, the ionosphere could go away tomorrow. I mean, if the sun decides to do something crazy, you know, the ionosphere is gone and the short wave ceases to exist. Uh, what's that? <laughs> um, from uh, the other part of amateur radio that's uh, interesting is experimentation. Um, no other radio service permits you, um, well, with the exception of Part 15, um, which is basically making small transmitters that don't radiate outside your room. Um, no other, uh, no other radio service allows you to tinker. Um, the FCC prohibits it. And the reason being is you have to cooperate with the other users on that frequency. Um, and tinkering with things can affect that. In amateur radio, it's assumed that you're going to be experimenting. Yeah, you will get some guy splattering his RF, you know, 200 kilohertz wide all, all over your signal, and it's like, oh, this guy's an idiot, you know, what is he doing? But uh, honestly, he's, he's experimenting, you know, and he's, he's doing it wrong, but he's experimenting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's, I mean, if he's doing it maliciously or, you know, repeatedly, yeah, that's, that's a problem, that's interference, but um, there's, there's room for experimentation. Um, and the other, other good thing about amateur radio is the opportunity to work with others. Um, if I build radio equipment in my basement, it's not very useful to me if there's no one else to communicate with. Uh, right? Everything about radio is something about communication, right? wireless communication. If there's no one else doing it, um, it's of limited use. Well, I don't want to say use because it, for, experimentation, uh, for experimentation, it doesn't have to have a defined purpose, right? You know, we make LED throwies. I mean, is that a use? I don't I'm, But um, without having someone to communicate, you're not even sure if your, your radio equipment's necessarily working over distance or what have you. Uh, limited exception, maybe uh, moon bounce, where you send uh, RF at the moon and uh, wait a little bit of, uh, what was it, about two seconds, and then listen to your own uh, signal coming back. So if you're, if you're really uh, you know, anti-social, you can just stick with that. Um, amateur radio licensing. So amateur radio is a licensed service. Um, you, you, need to have a, you need to have a license to use it. Um, for frequencies that are usable across the globe, there is a, there's an international treaty that governs, uh, governs that. And in this country, we have to deal with the FCC. Um, most of us don't like the FCC. Um, but you know, leave your hatred of the FCC on, for other concepts like censorship and that sort of thing. Leave them with the services they belong with. 
Um, for amateur radio, um, it's, it's useful. Purely technical standpoint, you don't need a license. Uh, you can build a radio right now, transmit you know, 20,000 watts into the sky. It, it'll work, it'll, it'll get the signal out. Um, depending on how much power and who you annoy will depend on how quickly the FCC responds. Um, and in limited circumstances, other authorities. Um, keep in mind the FCC does not govern government frequencies. So if you piss off the wrong people, yeah, those wrong people are gonna show up at your door, not the FCC. Thinking more like military, that kind of stuff. Uh, licensing allows coordination. Um, without licensing, it would be chaos. Um, and, and some people like chaos, yeah. But uh, At the beginning, uh, back in the 20s, there was, no, uh, there was no licensing and coordination was done on gentlemen's agreement. Um, but as radio became more prolific, um, coordination was needed. And uh, 1934, they, uh, Congress established the Communication Act, uh, Communication Act, and that basically laid the framework for the FCC and such. So uh, how do you get a license? You need to take an exam. Um, exams are offered actually at Nauticon on Sunday morning. Um, I know a lot of people have complained to me, why are the exams being offered on Sunday morning when everyone has a wicked hangover? Um, you know, maybe you're a good test taker on their hangover. I know I was in high school. Um, um, so yeah, um, I don't know why it's Sunday morning. I think it has to do with uh, the resources they could find, but um, that's the way it is. So if you're interested in taking an amateur radio exam, uh, it's Sunday morning, I think, nine. <laughs> um, I'll try to be there, because I, I actually need to upgrade. So yeah, there are different classes of license based on your, uh, uh, which exams you pass. Um, the technician is the basic one. There used to be five or six license classes. There used to be novice, technician, technician plus, general, advanced, and amateur extra. They got it down to three, which is close to what Europe's doing. Europe is class one and class two, which is probably what it should be. Um, technician basic rules, just so you're not, you know, you know what sort of what you're doing. Uh, a little bit of RF safety. Um, yeah, don't use a thousand watts of microwave into your face. I mean, that sort of thing. <laughs> Simple stuff. Um, and that gives you essentially all privileges above uh, above 30 megahertz on the amateur bands. So, um, and we'll get into more of what bands are used for and that sort of thing. Um, the general license, uh, a little more broad exam, covers some electrical engineering theory. It's not too bad um, with a quick study or if you're a, you know, a math nerd or an EE nerd, you'll, you can probably pass it without even studying. Um, they cover a little bit more on rules. Um, and of course the rules are specific to amateur radio, so you would have to cover that. And then there's the amateur extra. Um, yeah, I've taken it three times, failed it three times. Um, I don't like double E. I, I, I went to college to be a double E, I dropped out. But, um, so it, it's a little rough. Uh, but again, if you're a good test taker, you, you can pass it. Um, amateur radio licenses in the United States and most other countries, including all of Europe, do not require learning Morse code or taking a Morse code exam. Um, that has been gone for many years now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Morse, but yeah, you don't need no Morse code, so it's just a study out of a book. All the questions are published. They're in the public domain. Um, so you can look at the entire question pool. If you're good at memorization, you can memorize the entire question pool and just memorize the answers. You don't actually need to know the theory behind it. You probably, it, it may help if you know the theory behind it, especially if you wanna start playing with uh, hacking radios and that sort of thing. All right, amateur radio bands. So uh, there are different radio bands. I'm sure most of you are aware, um, you know, AM radio is, sort of in the medium wave kind of frequencies between um, what is it, 600 kilohertz and 
1600 kilohertz. Um, FM broadcast is, you know, the 88 megahertz up to 108 megahertz. Uh, your cell phones, depending on who your carrier is, you know, 900 megahertz or 1900 megahertz. You know, some of the 3G stuff is 1700 megahertz if you're on that weird T-Mobile carrier. Um, so yeah, everything broken up into different bands. Um, in the old days, the only bands they really bothered with were uh, HF or shortwave, some medium wave stuff. Um, and the reason being is they didn't really know how to work with some of the, the higher frequencies. They didn't have uh, reliable ways of generating um, frequencies. And the interesting part about HF is you don't need infrastructure, in the most case, to use it. Um, HF, depending on the time of day, depending on the solar cycle, um, the sun has a cycle where some years it's low number of sunspots, some years it's high number of sunspots, um, charges the ionosphere, different layers of the ionosphere. And your radio transmissions will bounce off the ionosphere, and you can get signals halfway around the world. Um, in rare cases, you can get them even all the way around the world. Um, so HF has been, for the, the long time, the, the uh, frequency of choice for amateur radios interested in what they call DX, which means long distance. I don't know where they got DX from. Don't ask. Um, that's, the HF bands are the ones that you need the general or higher license, with limited exception. A technician license can use, uh, they're permitted to use Morse code on some of the bands. I don't know why. It's, there's still some in the amateur community that are holding on to this Morse code thing, like it's the holy grail. And they're basically just nostalgic, and they, they may just die off eventually, I think. Uh, VHF and UHF. Uh, typically, if you see a whole bunch of radio nerds running around Nauticon and they have walkie-talkies in their pockets, me included, um, those walkie-talkies are either on uh, VHF or UHF. Um, they're two common bands that are used for basically talking around to people. Um, and it's in the limited way that, for example, people are using them at Nauticon right now, it's equivalent to buying an FRS radio at Walmart and talking around with it. We're not really doing anything so fancy with it. Um, one thing that amateur radio operators are allowed to do, though, is set up repeaters, where it's basically a radio system that receives and transmits at the same time. Um, this allows for much greater range with a portable radio or a radio in your car. Um, for example, here at Nauticon, they have something called a cross-band repeater, which goes between one of the UHF bands and the UHF bands, because one guy attending the con didn't have a UHF radio and everyone else was using one, so now, now it works for him. It basically receives the signal, transmits it over it simultaneously. Um, some amateur radio uh, clubs or groups of guys will set up repeaters that are linked together. Um, before the internet, this was always done using more radio. Um, there's a repeater network in the state of New York, for example, that goes from uh, Interstate 81 west all the way to the state line uh, at Erie, Pennsylvania, and um, the Ontario border. Um, it's, I think it's 17 different repeater sites now. They're all linked together. So anywhere you are, with your car, whatever, you can reach anyone in that whole area. Um, the other way that repeaters are, are linked today are via the internet, because hey, it's there, it's cheap. Um, so there are a bunch of guys doing that. Um, you can, some of them you can actually remote control with the little touch tone things, and you can dial up other repeaters. And, you know, whatever. Um, so basically you're using radio as the access to the internet, um, which, I mean, it's still radio, but we can use Skype, I mean, not that exciting. Uh, and then microwave bands, um, we're talking like around, where you consider it going to microwave, probably like 1.5 gigahertz and up might be considered microwave, um, yeah, maybe a little bit lower. Um, the hardware gets a little tricky in microwave. 
um, when you start creating hardware and have to deal with keeping traces in a certain geometric pattern to prevent the traces from radiating RF, that's when you're dealing with microwave. Um, very directional, and um, the good thing is, though, the bandwidth allocations in the microwave are huge. Like, I think uh, the 10 gigahertz band is between 10.1 and 10.5 gigahertz, so you're talking 400 megahertz of bandwidth. Um, so you can use them for point-to-point -point data links, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, these are some of the HF bands. Um, depending on what frequency, they might bounce off the ionosphere different ways. Um, some of the lower frequency stuff, everything below like seven megahertz, is good for, uh, for the nighttime, and something called NVIS, uh, Near Vertical Incidence Skywave. Um, basically sending radio waves straight up, or you know, almost straight up. Um, and believe it or not, it's really reliable. Um, even like the middle of the day, 100 watt transmitter sending radio waves straight up the, on uh, like the 3.8 megahertz band. Um, it's good because it's reliable, communications out 300 miles in every direction. Um, that's the technology, um, actually the, the Germans in World War II started using that technology. Um, uh, they started realizing, you know, oh wow, this, this works pretty good. Um, and it was used heavily in Vietnam um, by the Americans. Um, because by using it, um, if there was a, uh, someone like 15 miles away with uh, radio direction finding equipment, every time they would try to find the signal, the signal would appear to be coming from the sky. So it was particularly good for, uh, the military loves that. Um, these days it's getting replaced mostly by, uh, by encrypted satellites though. Um, the, uh, the metal bands, basically 10 megahertz up to, uh, oh wow, I never finished this slide. I left question marks, it's horrible. My apologies. Um, yeah, so 10 megahertz up to, I don't know, to 20, 20 or so. Um, good for daytime, and when the sunspot cycle is is towards its peak, um, these are these are very very useful. And then the 12 and 10 meter bands up to 29 megahertz, uh, very good for long range communications. Um, and there's hardly any noise. Um, back in let's see, two let's see 99 2000 when the around the peak of the sunspot cycle. Um, 25 watt radio in my car on lunch break at work. I was talking to someone in uh, Ivory Coast. So, yeah, this, this was a radio they sold at Radio Shack at the time, and Ivory Coast, I mean, it was crystal clear. It was like, it was sort of mind blowing, but. Um, VHF and above. <clears throat> uh, the six meter band is a weird one because sometimes it behaves like VHF, sometimes it behaves like HF. Um, two meters is one of them that's commonly used for repeaters, that's the VHF band I was talking about. Um, another thing called APRS, um, I can talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, UHF is particularly good for urban areas because it penetrates uh, buildings since the, uh, the wave is smaller, it can fit through windows and that sort of thing better. Uh, 900 megahertz is rarely used by amateurs, although uh, you can find a lot of used commercial gear if you like to modify, uh, modify that kind of stuff. Um, and then as you get up to the microwave bands, it gets a little more rare and a little more specialized. Um, and yeah, amateurs are assigned all the frequencies above 300 gigahertz, unrestricted. Um, I don't know anyone who's doing anything with 300 gigahertz though. Uh, I think it gets, I don't know, what part, did, what frequency does it become light? <laughs> Somewhere in there, I don't know. All right. Yeah, I suppose. But I mean, uh, but that's a good point though. That's why amateurs have that band. It's because at one time, and it's, it's dwindling now because at one time, amateur radio operators were the ones who were the innovators. 
and somewhere, I, I wanna say like maybe the 70s or 80s, yeah, I guess around the Cold War, it became defense contractors that were the innovators, and then eventually Motorola and the cell phone uh, groups, um, cell phone companies. They're now the, the ones who are doing all this innovation at some of these bands. Um, at one point, uh, I think in the early pre-World War II, um, some of the VHF bands and UHF bands were the same way 300 gigahertz is today. It's like no one's using these frequencies. You, you amateur radio operators, go ahead and do whatever you want. And that helped the, the whole radio technology. That's, that's some of the history behind why um, amateur radio is, is granted these huge swaths of bandwidth because we, we had an effect on this radio technology. Um, so the good things about amateur radio. There are a growing number of hacker types in amateur radio. Um, there's quite a few people at Nauticon that are, uh, that are into radio. Um, it, it grows every year. A few more people get interested into it. Um, I've seen a few radio guys running around at DEF CON sometimes. Um, so there is a growing number of, uh, of people that are interested in t tinkering. Um, even more that are not represented at these kind of hacker cons. They don't necessarily identify with the hacker um, you know, label, but they have the same mentality. Um, so I think that's, that's a good thing for amateur radio because it's displacing or, or replacing some of, the, uh, some of the people who are not of that mentality. Um, um, the other good thing is that there's plenty of people that are on the air that you can actually interact with, test your equipment with, um, uh, particularly in the, the low power uh, radio that's commonly called QRP. Um, there's, there's a number of uh, abbreviations that were developed during the days of Morse code um, so that people didn't have to write out please lower your power. I mean, that's a, that's a lot to send on a Morse code key. So they, they came up with these abbreviations. QRP means lower your power. Um, or QRP question mark means are you running low power? So uh, these QRP enthusiasts are guys that like to build radios that are five watts and under. Uh, there are also some guys that are QRP P enthusiasts that like to work with anything under 500 milliwatts. These guys actually make long range contacts with milliwatts of power. Um, and yeah, you do run into some of these old ham radio guys, the typical ham radio guy, you know, looks like 65, whatever, you know. You run into them and they, some of them actually, uh, many, actually know quite a bit. And I've run into several that have actually shown a lot of, you know, about the you know, radio technology, um, and some of them are, are, you know, of the hacker mindset, but clearly they would never label themselves hackers because, that, you know, they're, they're from a different generation. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, amateur radio operators were the hacker of the previous generations. Um, they were the, the innovators. They were like, okay, well, well, what does this do? Let's see if we can make it do, do it better. So. There are parallels between the amateur radio um, culture and the, um, culture's not the wrong word, um, the history of amateur radio and, and the hacker community. Amateur radio community and the hacker community, there we go. Um, so yeah, there are some really bad things about amateur radio as well though. Like, um, you know, the subtext is what, what the ARRL doesn't talk about. The a, um, the ARRL is the, um, it was named the American Radio Relay League, and they changed the name because the name is irrelevant these days, but they kept the abbreviation. Um, so it would be like, sort of like IBM, it was International Business Machines, and it's no longer International Business Machines, it's just IBM. Um, actually, I'm not sure if that's actually true. But yeah, they kept the abbreviation but lost the name. 
Essentially, they're the national association for amateur radio in the United States. Um, there's a CRRL in uh, Canada. Um, and they're essentially a lobbyist group. They lobby the federal government so that you know, amateur radio operators can keep, keep doing it. So in that aspect, it's pretty good. Um, they make sure that amateur radio operators are represented in the government. Um, and uh, Interworld also, though, publishes a magazine that is full of advertising, um, and they charge dues, so. They don't often talk about the problems that are going on in amateur radio. Um, one of them particularly, uh, the 75 meter band, which is and it's basically the nighttime, like, guys on radio just like bullshitting to each other. Um, I've talked to some really cool guys there that are just, they like to, you know, just talk and, uh, yeah, they, they talk too much, but some of them like to also like try to optimize their radio. They, their audio, there's a bunch of audio files there. They like to use old school like AM radio transmitters and stuff. And it, it sounds really good, you know, so. Uh, pretty, pretty good stuff, but that band is also full of some of the most disgusting communications I've ever heard. Worse than IRC. <laughs> I, I mean, I've, I've heard basically on-air clan meetings, that kind of garbage. It's disgusting. Um, and no one really can do anything about it. Hmm. Yes, I mean the Foot Clan. Or maybe not quite as worse as Open Fly on IRC. All right, so um, it's, it's a sad state of affairs, but it happens. Um, best way to deal with them is ignore them. Uh, as soon as you give them any, uh, you know, any audience, it just feeds them. Um, just like any other troll. So. Uh, the other thing is emergency communications. Uh, recently, particularly post 9-11, uh, emergency communications has been one of the forefront things that a lot of amateur radio operators have been pushing. Sorry. Um, and I, I, I participated with amateur, uh, amateur radio emergency communications quite a lot when I was uh, younger. I've been licensed since I was 14. I lived on Long Island. And one of the reasons why I got into amateur radio was um, the, um, I think I was 13, um, Avianca had a flight from uh, Bogota to JFK. And um, one night I'm doing my homework, whatever, and I hear this loud roar over my house. I was like, what was that? It sounded like a plane. I was like, well, we're not near JFK. Um, that plane went down to, um, uh, hmm. Three, four miles away. Uh, it was a 747, and um, it went down right by uh, one of the harbors in uh, off of Long Island. Uh, actually, right near the harbor. It, it landed on land. It crashed on land, um, and it was right near a political border. So there was very little coordination with the first responders. Um, one of the amateur radio groups in the area actually just said, "Okay." Something's going wrong, so they sent a whole bunch of people, and they helped with triage communications. And I got to hear this on my scanner. So um, that was one of the things that sort of got me into amateur radio. I was like, wow, that's, that's really important. So I helped out with um, uh, some of the, like, the Hurricane Gloria stuff and some of the um, flooding that's happened on Long Island, that sort of thing. Uh, handling communications for Red Cross and that sort of thing. Um, these days, though, um, the Red Cross is not relying so much on amateur radio operators because um, we have this new thing called HIPAA, the Health Insurance uh, Portability and Privacy Act, which basically states that you can't exchange personal information for people who are injured or, or sick or whatever um, in an unsecure way. And amateur radio is by definition, insecure. It's meant to be publicly monitorable. Uh, in fact, encryption is prohibited on amateur radio. So 
there's less going on with emergency communications. Like I said earlier, um, you can take some of the less important stuff off of the commercial uh, communication systems, move it onto amateur radio. Um, but back to these emergency communicators that aren't really emergency communicators. Some, uh, I believe the term is whacker, uh, or um, some people call them coders, uh, not, not coding, but uh, like when, a, when an ambulance goes on and turns on its sirens, it's called calling a code or whatever. Um, these guys are big into radio. They need to have all these radios and police stuff, and they like putting light bars on their cars, and just because they're emergency communicators. So I need a light bar. No, they don't. So um, they'll show up at things, emergencies that are totally irrelevant to communications. Um, just local emergencies don't need communications necessarily. Um, the other problem with uh, amateur radio is contests. Um, a lot of times the ARRL and other amateur radio organizations will sponsor these contests where people, the sole purpose of the contest is to contact as many people as possible in a short period of time. Um, and the entire exchange over the airwaves is your call sign, his call sign, or her call sign. And, um, signal report, and that's it. And maybe like what country you're in. Um, and it gets to the point sometimes with these contests, people just go crazy on it. It's like, it's, it's mayhem. And they'll take over the band, you know, like every frequency, you, and you wanna do something useful with the radio and there's no room for it. Um, some of them are good. Um, there's one called Field Day where the whole concept is to operate radios at a remote location without com commercial power and see if you have communications. I think that's, that's a reasonable thing, but a lot of these contesters will sit at home with commercially purchased equipment, very expensive commercially equi per purchased equipment, running 1,500 watts of power, and it's like, all right, it sort of takes the fun out of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't do this. This guy isn't necessarily a whacker. I don't, he's just whacked. I don't, this is not my car. I have owned a Plymouth Colt, but this is not the Plymouth Colt. Um, no. Apparently this guy didn't read the RF safety guidelines. That's what I was trying to figure out. It looks like a cell antenna. It's like, what? Do you have a bag phone in there? Because if you do, we can harvest parts out of that. He's got an antenna on the front bumper, like right below the grill. I don't know if you guys can see it. Yeah. He's got, he's got a, um, actually the antenna on the back appears to be a six meter horizontal on the directional, uh, they call it a turnstile antenna. Um, that's actually one of the only cool antennas he's got. Um, yeah, that's the inside of his car. <laughs> yeah, you're a tool. <laughs> Seriously, apparently someone, I don't know. Um, okay, um, for the lulls, hamsexy.com. Absolute, it, it, it's like 4chan for ham radio crap. It's hysterical. <laughs> All right, emergency communication showing up at a house fire. No, no, you don't belong there. Go away. All right, so uh, homebrew radio. Uh, why build it yourself? Well, the true spirit of amateur radio is building your own. Um, we wouldn't be hackers if we wanted to build our own stuff. Um, either buy it in the store and take it apart and rebuild it or mod it or whatever, or, oh, here's a, I just got a shipment from Mouser, let's build something. Um, so, believe it or not, for shortwave frequencies, it's pretty easy. The circuits are fairly simple. 
uh, especially if you are okay with dealing with simple kinds of modulation or none at all. Um, when I mean simple kinds, I'm talking about Morse code, even though we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, as you get higher in frequency, it can be difficult uh, to make simple circuits because the type of, you know, keeping leads short becomes an issue. Um, creating oscillators at those frequencies, you have to start dealing with frequency doubling and that sort of thing. Um, if you don't want to build your own radio equipment, um, when you're dealing with VHF and UHF higher, um, there are other opportunities. You can work on uh, dealing with uh, custom-made antennas, which are pretty easy to build. Um, the big thing recently I've been noticing on like uh, uh, New York City resistor blog, uh, a couple of uh, one of the guys there uh, built a, a satellite antenna so you can work some of the low Earth orbiting satellites, um, and then building modems. I'm currently working on. Uh, I was hoping to have it done by now, but I didn't quite make it. Uh, Arduino-based uh, radio teletype modem. Uh, radio teletype is still used today, even though it's sort of antiquated, but uh, it, it was a fun concept to try to get the Arduino. No other modem chips, just one at mega chip, generating and demodulating um, radio teletype tones. So that's, that's one of my works in progress there. Um, you can build your own test equipment. Uh, frequency counters are um, something that are relatively easy to build. For, um, for some reason, using the PIC microcontrollers over the Atmega are easier because there's something, uh, I, someone tried to explain it to me, was it yesterday? I think I drank too much, so. I had a hard time trying to grasp it, but apparently using a pick is easier than using an Atmega. I think it has something to do with the timer, uh, the way the timer works. Um, and then the other, um, like bench equipment, uh, frequency sources, like an RF generator. Um, uh, some guys, and I don't, I don't have schematics for that one, um, basically creating an oscillator that oscillates exactly 10 megahertz and uses GPS input to to discipline the accuracy of the signal uh, down to one part in a billion. So we're talking like lab grade stuff that they're building in their house. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, here's a guy in India, uh, came up with the, this design for a frequency counter uh, using a, uh, what is that, 16 by one uh, LCD display um, circuit. It's one pick, one LCD. Yeah, I think he's got a, uh, what is that, a voltage regulator in there? Um, and a couple uh, transistors and a crystal. So a really simple circuit. Um, and boom, you have a frequency counter. They, they sell online for anywhere from 100 to 500 bucks. All right, Morse code. I both hate and respect Morse code. Uh, I don't know love there, I don't know if I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you'll hear uh, amateur radio operators talking about Morse code as CW. Uh, it stands for continuous wave. Essentially, Morse code is sent by turning on a transmitter, and it sends a continuous sine wave at the frequency you're trying to send. And turning it on and off is the Morse code key. Learning Morse code by ear takes a lot of patience. It takes attention span. I have neither. Um, there are a couple of good sites. Um, uh, this guy Fabian Kurtz from, uh, from Germany, uh, DJ1YFK, uh, he is a champion Morse code operator. Um, he's 25 years old. Um, he can send and receive Morse code upwards of 60 words per minute. Um, it's, I, I can't even comprehend how he does it, but he, he does it somehow. Uh, he came up with uh, a website, um, lcwo.net, learncwonline.net. Um, so if you're interested in learning Morse code just because you want to play with it or you want geek cred or whatever, um, that, that's a good resource. Um, I've been trying to learn it. Uh, I, I learned it at one time fast enough to pass the Morse code test when I was a kid. Um, 
have rarely used it on the air. Um, to this day, I can still maybe copy it at like three or four words a minute. Uh, it's really, really hard for me. Uh, I think some people are, have just have a gift and can do it really well, and some people are particularly prone to having difficulty with it. Um, you don't need to know Morse code for pretty much anywhere. Um, I think like Slovakia still requires it, and some, I think China maybe. Um, and it's still the simplest form of RF that you can decipher by ear. Um, it's a tone that's turned on and off at a reasonably slow rate, um, so you can figure it out by ear. And that's why it was used for such a long time. Um, you can build a Morse code transceiver with a limited number of parts. You can buy kits online to build a full transceiver for like 20 or 25 bucks, um, maybe even less if you're talking about really low power stuff. Um, and if you're really lazy like me, you can have your computer figure it out for you. Uh, digital signal processing is your friend. And why aren't my slides moving? Oh, there we go. So yeah, Morse code and crystal control, really simple. Uh, by crystal control, I mean you have one quartz crystal that, generates, uh, uh, that drives an oscillator. Um, it works on one frequency. It's really, really basic. And it's basically like your crystal radio sets that they would have back in the 50s or whatever, only your transmitter and receiver. Um, yeah, kits cost around $10. There's one called the Pixie 2. Uh, it's one frequency, really simple design. Um, some company in California still makes them. Yeah, it's 10 bucks with like two bucks for shipping. They send it US Postal Service. Um, comes with the crystal and everything, comes with the board. Um, or you can recycle parts from discarded electronics. Das Derelicht. Uh, Mike Rainey from, uh, I don't want to say Connecticut. Um, so he uh, discovered that he was having a whole bunch of these um, complex for fluorescent bulbs fail on him. So he decided to crack them open and discovered that there was tons of parts inside. Um, I think he had to add the crystal himself and possibly a resistor and a coil. And those are all the parts harvested from the uh, CFL. Uh, there's the actual CFL that he uh, used, the part number and all that fun stuff. Yeah, and just be careful, they're filled with mercury. Uh, but yes, you can harvest parts out of them and make yourself your own little transmitter. He's working on a receiver, it's still sort of in beta, um, but that's pretty cool. Um, oh, I'm running out of time. Uh, QRSS, so yeah, the other Q symbol would be QRS, which means send more slowly. QRSS means really, really slow. Minutes per bit, rather than bits per second. Um, if you send a signal at a very low speed and use very low bandwidth, you can use milliwatts of power um, to get thousands of miles. Some people are even dealing with microwatts of power. Um, as an example, uh, one of my friends, K6HX in California, uh, pretty cool guy, works for Pixar. Um, if you look sort of in the middle here, right about there, you can see his call sign sends, this was received somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, that's K6HX right there. Um, yeah, that was sent using um, 100 milliwatts of power um, halfway across the country. Uh, and there's another guy in there with a, looks like a buzzsaw kind of pattern he did there. Um, I think he IDs somewhere in there with his call sign. Um, software defined radio. Um, so, yeah, what, why do we need all this fancy hardware? Just use something really simple bring the frequency that we're trying to listen to or transmit on down to something more manageable, and use the digital signal processor that's in your bag, which is a laptop with a sound card, because pretty much all laptops will do 48 kilohertz um, digital signal processing. Um, so yeah, a kit that um, uh, Tony Parks KB9YIG developed uh, is called the Soft, right, Soft Rock 2 Lite. Um, it's a very simple receiver for seven megahertz. Um, it consists of uh, a local oscillator, a uh, divider, uh, the mixer, uh, you got your power input, a voltage regulator, 
Uh, the antenna comes in and out it spits out the signal and the signal in quadrature, which is essentially shifted in phase by 90 degrees. Um, the theory behind it has never been my forte. I, I, I've seen it work, I know it works, but I can give you a theory paper if you wanna meet up with me later, I can, I can show you the theory. It, it's a lot of maths and I, I, don't, I don't grok it too well, um, but it's cool. Um, and then the software to go along with it. <clears throat> uh, this is called Rocky. Uh, it's sadly only for Windows, but there is some, some Linux stuff that, uh, called DTTSP. Um, that's for Linux. Um, it does not get billed stably on OS X. Uh, that's why I had to deal with the Windows piece. Um, and basically what you're looking at there is an image of uh, a whole bunch of radio spectrum. Um, make it go. All right, I wanted to do a live demo of, of the, uh, the soft rock, but there's too much RF interference inside here with an in indoor antenna, so I will quickly do a demo uh, with some, st I captured some of the data um, earlier, so I'll basically play it. Basically the input that this would provide, I have in a waveform file, and I will provide that to the software just to show you what it looks like. Okay. The what? How many people like computers? <laughs> epic fail is epic. <laughs> All right, so here's Rocky. All right, this is going to turn on the computer audio, so. Hopefully it's not too, oh wait, it's not gonna be loud at all. No, it will be. Okay, so basically here, we're looking at a snapshot of a whole bunch of RF spectrum. Uh, this is all kilohertz on the side. Um, so you can see different chunks here. So here's, here's a signal here. Uh, these are, I think, Italian guys talking here. He's got a rough accent, so it's hard to understand him, but he's calling CQ, which is typically a way of saying, I'm looking for anyone to talk to. Uh, so basically, this is a type of AM modulation called single sideband. Uh, AM radio has a, typically has a, a carrier and two sidebands of information, which are exact mirrors of each other. Uh, to save bandwidth, you filter out the carrier and one of the sidebands and you have a single sideband. Um, the cool thing about using software to find radio is if you wanted to filter this to be narrower, you can do that on the fly, whereas in a hardware-based radio, you would have to design another filter. Also, a typical crystal-controlled radio would not be able to be frequency agile in, in this fashion. We need something called a variable frequency oscillator. But by, by outputting a large swath of bandwidth to the digital signal processor, the sound card, we now have a frequency agile radio. Um, this radio kit cost $15. All you need is a, a wire antenna out a window and it inputs into the sound card and, and this free software. Um, the software is uh, open source, you can hack on it, and it was also DTTSP, which is a, um, uh, a Linux version uh, command line, so you can do some uh, other interesting stuff with it. One group that's, uh, I'll just stop this here. 
One group that's done something cool with DTTSP is, uh, oops, where did I go my, how am I on time? A couple minutes? Yeah. Uh, this board is just receive. There are other boards that are multi-band, meaning they can do the whole swath of HF bands um, and do transmit uh, a one watt transmitter. Um, and then you could always add a 20 watt uh, amplifier on top of that. Um, but this board, to keep it simple and make it relevant for, for everyone at Nauticon, it's just a receiver. Uh, we have kits of them uh, up in the, uh, the ham radio room. Uh, we're gonna be doing a build session tomorrow if people wanna come by and they wanna learn more about it and build them, sh uh, build them yourself. Um, probably sometime after like 11 or so tomorrow. Uh, you can just look for me I'll, uh, either in the ham radio room or in the hacker spaces room. Uh, let's see. Not connected to the internet. Oh, to nose. Z O M G point. All right, so yeah, this group in the, the Netherlands uh, took some of these uh, software defined radios and they created a web app around them. Uh, unfortunately, it runs Java. However, and Safari doesn't deal with Java too well. I'm gonna try to get it to work though. Come on. Make it go. There we go. So yeah, they have three different ones of these receivers uh, for three different bands. And so if you wanna try out this technology and you don't wanna build hardware, or you don't wanna download applications, whatever, um, I'll put this link on my, uh, on my wiki, uh, or you can find me and get the link from me. Um, you could try out this technology. Basically it's running in a Java app and it talks to their radio equipment um, using a stream. Um, so you can try out the receivers, and uh, they're in the Netherlands. They have really good antennas, so you can hear some really interesting radio transmissions and stuff. And the cool thing about the software-defined radio is, even if someone else is listening, there are some on on online shortwave radios. If someone else is listening, they set the frequency, and, and you just, you know, if someone else changes it, it's changed. Whereas this, it's capturing the whole bandwidth of that frequency, so you can have multiple people listening to different things, different types of, you know, it could be audio, it could be data, or whatever. Um, so it's a lot more flexible. Um, I think that's it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so amateur radio, uh, I, I believe, is interesting to, ha uh, to hackers. Um, but you basically have to focus on what's relevant to hackers, the experimental stuff. Ignore the trolls, ignore the other crap. Uh, Software-defined radio, it's still relatively in its infancy, so it's a good time to start playing with it and tinkering with it. And uh, tons of resources online, Google for things like QRP, SoftRock, QRSS. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see some growth of amateur radio in the hacker community. And uh, also, instead of using PCs for software-defined radio, using uh, DSP chips like the, uh, uh, the DSPIC, um, things like that, FPGAs, that sort of thing. Uh, any questions? Radio steganography. Okay, there is. Okay, there's a there's a type. Okay, the question was, are there any uses of radio steganography? Um, since you saw that waterfall kind of display, um, there is a um, an encoding method called um, uh, Hellschreiber. 
uh, which is basically they'll encode different tones. Um, and rather than demodulate the tones like a, a data stream, it's meant to be read visually. Um, if someone was to send those tones onto, you know, spaced out appropriately, different frequencies, it would start making like a scrolling display across my screen. So you could use something like that to try to like embed messages in something. Uh, you could potentially subtly embed that into, say, a voice communication. Um, anyone else? All right, thank you.